listening to the Why Are You Interview Podcast, Episode 22. Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Why Are You, an interview podcast about identity. Well, in our last episode, we heard a story from a transgender writer as she described her journey and healing through the use of a daily journal. In this episode, we meet Sabine, a true artist whose creativity helped fuel her through long years of gender dysphoria before finally becoming whole. And she lives close to me, too. It's fun. This content is brought to you by subscribers of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber to Gender Identity Today, thank you so much. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as my writing and the writing of other contributors to Gender Identity Today, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Enjoy this interview with Sabine. All right, and joining me today on the program, I have Sabine with me. Sabine, first of all, thank you very much for joining me to talk about Why Are You? Hey, Ali. I am really glad to be here. Not as glad as I am to have you. I, I got to tell you, I've meant to do this. How long have we known each other? Like six months, five it's months? About six months, five months, yeah. So I've meant to, meant to ask you to do this for about six months. So here we are finally, which is good. Yeah. Um, it will probably come as a surprise to everybody, to anybody listening. I do not know Sabine through Medium. That's that's how I know everybody else. But Sabine is, is that's not how I met Sabine. We actually live close to each other and have met each other in person. Um, in fact, we ate lunch today, didn't we? It's a yeah. lovely, a yeah. lovely bit of ramen that I had. Uh-huh. Um. As a result, and here's my little intro on you. I mean, you know, Sabine, I've been to your house, and it was a lovely house, by the way. Thank um, you. <laughs> sure, but I saw that you have um, you have paintings that you've that you've painted. I guess that's the verb for it, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not much of an artist, so th- there are paintings that you have on your wall that, that you actually created yourself, which is Im- impressive to me, first of all. I, I know also that you are a professional web designer. You had mentioned some video work that you do and then um, some other creative work. Uh, so I just, you know, let me stop right there. I mean, painting, this is, I mean, this is something you've done for a long time? It is. I have always been attracted to art and um, from a very young age and, you know, I got into it um, and started doing just basically everything, you know, um, that I could to to create. And over the course of my early 20s, I really got kind of good at, you know, airbrush stuff and things like that mm-hmm. right at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, I did some gas tanks and part of a side of a van and all that sort of stuff with the oh airbrush. Gosh. Um, and then, awesome. you know, some artwork that ended up in a gallery or two, um, you know, which was kind of cool. Um, but then I really kind of, I found oil painting and I was lost. I mean, honestly, I was lost. And I stopped doing everything else. I stopped doing pen and ink. I stopped doing color pencil. I stopped doing marker art in favor of oil painting. And, you know, eventually I found that hand in hand with oil painting comes drawing and charcoal, right? Drawing mm. and pencil and charcoal um, and all of that. And that also captivated me. So these days, now, I paint in oil and I draw in charcoal. And that's really all I do. Did, I don't, did you did you have any, um, like, have you do, had education? I don't know what the words I want to use for this. Like professional training in this? So when I was 18... I went and did a year and a half of commercial art school. Okay. Um, I had to actually stop and make a living um, because I I ended up leaving my house when I was 18 um, and forging out on my own. And so I did not finish my commercial art degree. Um, And for me, really, 
training and mentorship. Training for me came in the form of mentorship. Sure. Other than that, I was self-taught well enough to the point where I got some really good mentors, right? And so, yeah. you know, the first one was a gentleman named David Martin. Um, David was a science fiction fantasy artist. He did a bunch of things for all of the old games and um, various things for, you know, Lord of the Rings and Iron Crown Enterprises and, oh, wow. you know, all the tabletop role-playing games at the time. And David was amazing. And so I approached him at a convention, um, asked that, that, you know, can I come watch him paint um, and learn? And he said no. And the next year... I figured. At the I was going to say, did that work? Holy cow. Yeah, but no. Okay. The next year at the same convention, I saw him again. But I had pieces in the art show. Oh, okay. And, you know, um, I kind of cajoled him to come over to my to my area and see my work, right? Come up and see my etchings in the art show. Sure. And while we were looking, I said, you know, I still would love to come and watch you paint. And he said, no again. <laughs> but then he came back later in the convention and was like, you know, I've been thinking about this. And yeah, why don't you come on up? And wow. so I painted with David for, you know, three or four um, years. And it was just really quite amazing because he took me through all of these amazing things. In fact, you can see just the corner of a Frazetta, Frank Frazetta painting that we did together. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a pencil sketch that Frazetta had done originally. He never painted it in oil. Um, and David and I painted it together. And David did that in order to teach me how Frazetta actually painted because David was a protege of Frank Frazetta. Oh, um, they got to meet him and, and, you know, I can't remember whether he studied with him, but he certainly knew his technique. Yeah. And so that was really just quite awesome. And so, yeah, so David was kind of my first mentor. Um, and then eventually I ended up with a gentleman named William Whitaker. And Bill has since passed, but he was an amazing painter. Just so talented and so good. And I got to study with him for a couple of years. And I lived in Utah. I went out to visit him, painted you know, in the mornings and then would come and join him. I painted on my own stuff in the morning, would come and join him in his studio in the afternoon. Um, we talked about what I painted, what I worked on that morning, and then, you know, we'd spend the rest of the afternoon with me just basically watching him paint. Oh, and, I mean, you know, Bill was a gallery painter. He had stuff in Santa Fe and Hilton Head and various places all over, you know, the country. He was yeah. a consummate painter, a master painter. And so, yeah, I was so fortunate to have those people as mentors from my artwork right it, forgive me on this too because i am not an artist by any sense of the word i would say um i think you're an artist well thank I think you your art is a different <laughs> is a different medium right you are more of a written word yes. um artist right i've not seen you paint or draw but you know yeah. you may have those talents as well no not in the least because i was gonna well I mean, my drawing has always been very <sighs> juvenile, but one of the, one of the medium, was it media? What was it? What, what, I always thought it would be cool to be able to, to paint in oil. And, and I have my own ideas around that. What, what is it that's, that's compelling about painting in oil? So at this point, painting in oil is, you know, what, six 800 years old, right? Sure. And it is, it's perfect in its form and its function. And when you paint an oil, you can create a work that creates what I call a wall presence, right? Because oil paints are translucent. It's pigment suspended in an oil medium, and the light will penetrate that. The light will go through I those see. layers, bounce yeah. off the reflective ground that you've got in there, right? It's some sort of a gesso or, a, you know, whatever it is that you've got underneath there, and it will come back out. And an oil painting can be luminous on the wall. It creates a real wall presence that you can't get in a lot of other mediums. And it's so forgiving. You can blend and you can move shapes around and, you know, it doesn't dry until, you know, a week later or even the next day if you want to use some dryers with it, you know, to make it, to make it work faster for you. So... Yeah. It's very forgiving. It's very complicated. There's there's a level of complexity to painting in oils, but 
you know, I went through those complexities and I learned them, and I, I would like to think I mastered them at least in part. So, yeah. I, the work I've seen so far, and admittedly, I haven't seen everything that you've done, but the work I've seen looks, I mean, masterful, truly. Oh, yeah. Oh, you no. know, to to my to my eye, anyway. So, <clears throat> well, I'm curious. You're welcome. I'm curious too. The, I mean, you spent a lot of time working with a couple of artists and learning, you know, learning their techniques. But you started at eight, uh, just before eighteen. Sorry, you said it was about sixteen, fourteen, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How did how did your art end up? informing your all the struggles of life i mean professionally and ultimately you know personally hopefully the personal came first but sure. how, how does your art really inform your life so i i don't know whether you may have noticed but i'm transgender i know <laughs> and so yeah you know there's amazing there's an amazing thing and i call it amazing and i think it is amazing is that transgender people who are closeted, as I was for, you know, 50 plus years of my life, um, tend to be able to pour all of that emptiness, that energy that we are denying ourselves into other things. And so, you know, I found that, that Positive transgender people can be quite brilliant at things because they have to pour themselves into something else. And I was doing that. I was denying my authentic self. You know, I mean, it was the 1980s. There was no chance of doing mm -hmm. that. Or if there was, I was unable to unlock it at that time, even though yeah. I, I didn't make a run at it. And so I poured myself into anything else that was not that, right? So I really tried to create for myself something that I could uh, disappear into. And art was that. And so, you know, I mean, I really went after it. And so when I picked up the airbrush, I worked and I worked and I worked and I mastered the airbrush as fast as I could. And I did as much work as with it as I could, right? I mean, you know, I, I had every single Bob Ross painting video Every single episode, I painted for, you know, weeks and weeks with Bob Ross until I mastered the Bob Ross technique, um, understood it, and could move on from it. And so it's that kind of obsession. When I got into oil painting, you know, I, I went and I found, um, you know, these old books, these old works. I was fortunate enough to be able to see some old masterworks, and that was one of the ways I taught myself how to paint in oil was I reproduced three old master paintings. I see. Right? Um, and so I say old master. William Adolf Bouguereau was, was two of them, um, and Hans Holbein was one. Um, okay. Bouguereau was really a kind of a pre-Raphaelite painter. Um, and so, but, you know, I mean, the, the concept is there, right? You find the work of someone that you absolutely admire um, who right. knows their craft, and... You pick a painting of theirs and you reproduce it. And I did that with two Bouguereau paintings and um, the painting of Sir Thomas More by Hans Holbein that he painted, I think, in 1497, you know, and yeah. Thomas More is there. He's got his chain of service. He's got the ermine sort of cloak yes. on. His sleeves are velvet. I mean, the amount of cool... He has stubble. He has stubble. Oh, gosh. And so, you know, all of that sort of stuff that you learn, how do I paint this? How do I do this? Yeah. And so it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to go through that struggle and figure that out and learn how to paint. And, you know, I had, at that point, not a lot else going on in my life that I was in, engaged in. And so I sure. poured myself into my art. Um, and that was kind of, you know, how that worked. Yeah. It's interesting you call that an emptiness, though, that you poured the emptiness, because clearly it was, clearly well, you maybe, were very full. Maybe it was the energy that I was filling myself with, right? The, yeah. You, you have this emptiness, right? I was not able yeah. to be authentic. Yes. I was not able to acknowledge that in society, mm. you know. Um, 
And so, you know, I had to do something else. And, you know, somehow I found this drive and this energy to yeah. create something for myself that I could then disappear into. Sure. Right? And that's yeah. a temporary solution at best. Um, Obviously. It, it did okay for me for a while, um, you know. And so it also creates some some negative connotations into that because I was so eager to master the techniques, to understand what was on my brush and what I was putting on my canvas, that I didn't go through the process that a lot of people go through, which is, you know, art is, is the, the combination of skill and something to say, mm. right? So there's this application of, I have something to say, and now I'm going to use my artistic talents, my technical knowledge in order to bring that, you know, hopefully, you know, for me, it was a 3D image on a 2D surface. Sure, sure. Right? Um, and so, you know, what you find is that you're still hollow inside. And so yes. what is it that you actually have to say with your art? I, I'm a brilliant technician, but I still struggle with that. Hmm. I still struggle with that. Even after transitioning, I struggle with, what am I going to say? What do I want to say with my art? Because I never had that opportunity. I was just like, just do this in order to fill that emptiness. Just disappear into this and understand it from the beginning to the end as much as you can. Become, you know, as, as, as accomplished at it as you can. You know, which is fine had I been like a brain surgeon, you know. Or done something. You you see what I mean? You know, oh, it's like oh, absolutely. You know, yes. I take things out of people's brains. Awesome. Okay. Um, but with art, it's two facets. There's technical skill, but then there's also that that you know, what are you trying to say with right. your art? And right. that was something that I never really had for a long time, and I still struggle with that. What are some of the subjects? I mean, earlier subjects I'm more, I'm more thinking about, but where does some of the uh, the subjects that you did feel had something to say? I guess it doesn't have to be early, but at any point, what subjects did you finish and went, there we go, I said something? Yeah. Um, so I am drawn to drawing and painting people. Okay. Um, for me, that, that really, really speaks to me. I love the human form. I love how graceful and elegant and articulate it can be. Um, I love skin tones and all of that mm. sort of stuff, right? So again, that's a little technical, but I really like the, the concept of, you know, capturing, capturing moments, right? And there are painters whose work, you know, they stop you dead in your tracks. Sure. If you actually oh, sure. see the work, right? You know, John Singer Sargent, he painted portraits, right? He painted portraits of people, a lot of, you know, ladies in fabulous gowns. But, you know, um, the work was so amazing and so stunning that, you know, for me, at least, it stopped me dead in my tracks, right? It just stopped me dead. And that was that's always been something that I wanted, I wanted to have in my art. Um, I don't know that I've ever captured that necessarily, um, simply because I haven't really explored it well enough either at this point, you know. I'm still on the backside of transition and trying to figure out now, you know, how do I live? Mm -hmm. um, and where does my art fit in that? Right. Because I'm, I'm in year three now of, of you know, um, being transitioned, and I'm still... You know, like we talked today at lunch, I'm still kind of calming down. Sure. Figuring out who am I now? Yeah. I've done this. You know? and, and it seems common in the community to be hard on yourself, too. You could have created, you, you probably have created some amazing stuff that you look at and you go, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, we are our own, our own worst, worst critics, for sure. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. And so, um, yeah. you, you know, I, to, to your point, the stopping you in your tracks, <clears throat> there was this, um, so I went to the Getty Center because, you know, I lived in Los Angeles. I, I absolutely yeah. Oh, my gosh. 
Yeah, I only went there a few times. But there was one time I was walking through, and I don't, I don't even know what the exhibit was. But I go walking through, and there was, it was small. I mean, it was maybe, you know, eight and a half by 11, probably not. Sure. But, you know, maybe something metric. But I st- there was this, you could tell where the light came from, and there were just glints, and, and the, um, the application of light in the painting was just stunning. And I went, oh, my God, who is that? And I went and I looked at it. It was Renoir. I have yeah. never seen another, like, Renoir that stopped me like that. But I know I was walking through, and I remember turning and kind of going, oh, Oh, my gosh. And he just kept on leaning in until finally some, you know, guard comes running up and is like, hey, get the fuck away from him. Get to <laughs> touch like, the... No, no, you can't touch the art. You can't looking at it. Close. But, yeah, no, I totally get that, right? I totally get that. Um, in fact, it was in the Getty. There was a, a John Singer Sargent uh, painting of a, of a lady. Okay. She's in this grand, voluminous gown, right? And, you know, when you're looking at it, what you realize is that the, head, the, the face and the hands are painted to a level of precision and accuracy and detail that literally you could get this close to it, and yeah. they are just absolutely perfect. Sure. But then as you travel out, up the sleeve or down the neck and into the bodice, it becomes more brushy and more painterly oh, to the point where the bottom of her gown, there was a satin ribbon that was clearly intended to be sewn on the bottom of the gown, that was a single swipe of a two-inch brush. Huh. I mean, you know, and that that is magic, right? That yeah. is visual magic. When you see it, you step back about nine feet, and the entire painting knits itself together in your eye, and it becomes all the same level of detail, sure. and it's just so breathtaking. You know, the same way with Monet's water lilies. If you've ever mm-hmm. seen a Monet, an original Monet water, water lily painting, if you do that, if you step up close and then you start stepping back and stepping back, at some point the water lilies will appear to float up off the canvas. Oh, interesting. Right? Okay. Because Monet, Manet, all of those first round of Impressionist painters, they were all classically trained. They knew and understood the rules that they were breaking to create Impressionist works. And so, you know, Monet in particular would do this complementary analogous color schemes where he would put these complementary colors with the color on the opposite side of the color wheel with them yes. and in these little dabs of paint. And that creates a vibrancy in the eye. And that means that, you know, when you step back a certain distance, those water lilies look like they're floating up off the canvas. And it's just awesome. Oh, if I get the chance to see one... Yeah, no, now, it's uh, breathtaking. I think the Denver Museum had one for a while. Oh, really? Oh. I don't know if they still have one. Go see the Bouguereau, if nothing else, because okay. it's exquisite. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I only, it has been, gosh, I don't know, maybe six or eight months. I read a book on color theory. I'm not sure when. Maybe, yeah, maybe eight or ten months ago. Because I was really more concerned about, about makeup, <laughs> for what it's <laughs> worth. Sure. But... But I learned that, that, that the, um, the Impressionist painters would tend to do that. They would take two complementary colors in order to, to draw a different color out. And yeah. it was, you know, for the life of me, I'd looked at those paintings when I was 18 going, God, I could have done that in like third grade. Why is that, you know? But, but then you, you zoom in far enough and then I'm like, oh, maybe yeah, I didn't maybe have not. quite maybe that sophistication. Quite that. Yeah. So my, that was sixth grade, probably, when I did that work. So. For you, you know, for you. <laughs> right, for me. So y- you've mentioned several artists, though. Um, I actually, you said the Hans Holbein, Holbein, is it Holbein or Holbein? I think it's Hans Holbein. Okay, I'll yeah. take that. Um, I remember that Thomas More, that Sir Thomas More. I, I actually yeah. can visualize that. It's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned several artists, though. Is there one in particular who had been, who has been influential to you? Or I mean, the, the sure, most influential, I'm for sorry. For sure, Bouguereau, right? William okay. Adolf Bouguereau, he painted in the late 1800s. He was one of the pre-Raphaelites. He was kind of, I guess, what you might call a commercial artist of his day, right? He was producing paintings for the rich people. 
Okay. I mean, he painted like 400 or 500 paintings oh, shoot. in his wow. lifetime. A lot of them were pastoral scenes of, you know, young girls at wells or, you know, nymphs and fairies dancing in forest scenes. But his painting skills were consummate. His flesh tones are just amazing. The level of detail is just wonderful. Hmm. And even though, you know, a lot of artists will sneer at him today and maybe even some museum curators, um, you know, I find that um, his works are not often as highlighted because he was so popular in his day. Sure. So even though you. they are splendid, they are spectacular. Yeah. Um, you know, and then the other painting painter that I absolutely loved was a guy named Joshua Reynolds. And Reynolds was kind of a maverick. He was, you know, he would do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and even in his lifetime, he was using bitumen, which is basically asphalt, you okay. know, tar in a lot of his colors. He would mix in this bitumen and his browns or his blacks. Um, and even within his lifetime, his paintings started cracking and falling apart. Oh, shoot. And, you know, it's like, oh. But he was so talented. There's actually a story um, from, from um, somewhere that I had heard about an art dealer who was talking to a couple. They were wanting to get a portrait done, and they were considering Reynolds. And they expressed concern because it was his paintings were starting to deteriorate already, and they expressed concern about this. And this art dealer is purported to have said, you know, no matter, even if it were to fall apart within a year, it will still be the finest thing you will ever own. Sure, sure. Right? And so, you know, again, I think Denver, the Denver Art Museum has a, has a Reynolds drawing, at least one drawing, if not a painting. And okay. um, go see it. I mean, his work right. is stunning, spectacular. And there's so many more. I mean, I've got, over here, I've got bookshelves filled with, with old masters and who I've studied and looked at, and I just love their works. Okay. I want to go to Florence one day, and I want to go to the museums, and I want to go to all the churches, right, and see those yep. amazing paintings. Yes, so, yes. And, you yeah. know, I have a friend who was just in Italy recently, and I'm like, Ooh. oh gosh, really? So, yeah. do do you want to go to uh, you want to go to Denver together? The we idea should. of like, we I would love that. One hundred percent. Okay. One hundred percent. Let's go to the art museum. I mean, All what right. a wonderful trip. Yes. No, you're on. There's no okay. doubt. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Let me let me move let me move uh, toward toward the present here. Sure. You so now you're now you are doing web design and you mentioned other creative um, pursuits and I guess I'm not sure what all the the other creative mm-hmm. pursuits are. Um, let me ask that question first. What, what other what oh. else are you doing? So the thing that I discovered kind of early on is that no matter how good you are, it, it's really hard to make a living as a visual yes. artist, as a painter, sure. any of that sort of stuff, right? You've got to be able to paint this painting and have 10 or 15 more ready to go. And then you've got to convince a gallery to take it and put it wherever that they can. And hopefully they like you and they promote you. And so I made several runs at being an artist, being a full-time artist. And that never worked, never worked. I always ended up having to go back into industry, go back into kind of corporate land and, you know, do that. And that's kind of where I got my start was I was a graphic designer as well as doing learning how to paint when I was in my, you know, early 20s. And I kind of started through that. And so even though I began as a graphic designer, I always kept those skills going all the way through my career. And I became a manager and I did all this stuff, you know, worked for Beltway Bandits out in Washington, D.C. I worked for IBM, um, did all kinds of stuff. And, you know, it was a great career. Um, you know, if they were as, as my old self, as my non-authentic sure. self was. Sure. Um, and so, you know, eventually I ended up at a point in my life where I got, um, I got laid off from a job where I was doing a really good job, but there was some conflict because, um, well, I won't get into why there was conflict, but there was some conflict. And so they laid there's, me off. There's still a non-disclosure agreement in place, right? Yeah. There's... No, no, not disclosure. But they laid me off with six months worth of severance. Mm. And so I had a full paycheck for six months. Yeah, sure. And I had friends in Australia who had a bed and breakfast 
um, on a place called Flinders Island. Okay. And I went to Flinders for six months and I ran a B&B. And I oh cooked gosh. meals for guests. And it was this amazing opportunity that took me to the other side of the planet mm -hmm. on an island of about 800 people. Um, and I was suddenly, you know, as it were, 10,000 feet above my life back in the U.S. Sure. Having just been laid off, looking down on it for six months and having six months to contemplate, well, what's next? What do you want to do? And I determined that I couldn't go back into, into industry to be, you know, a corporate girl anymore. I just couldn't do that. You know, sure. the money was fabulous, but, oh, my gosh, you know, they, they just own you, heart and soul. And the work was without soul, right? I was mm -hmm. a manager, oh, sure. I was a proposal manager, a contract manager, I was doing all that sort of stuff. So I decided that I wanted to keep pursuing my artwork and I opened up a, a custom picture framing store when I got home. Right. And almost immediately my phone began to ring for, because people were like, oh, you're back, do you want a job? And I was like, no, I don't want a job, but we were, in 2007, 2008, and you may recall that the economic situation at that point mm -hmm, was that sure. we were heading into a depression, and I had just started a brand new business. Mm -hmm. And people buy custom picture framing with their disposable income, right. and you just headed into a recession. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know, I'm happy to consult. And so that was when, you know, my, my web design, graphic design, um, consulting business really kind of got started up again, and you know I would I would go and run run our proposal team for a company or help them to you know create and format their annual report, um, and so gradually I began building more work like that and getting kind of a reputation, and so I did that for twelve years. I ran my picture framing store and I consulted, um, and then in twenty nineteen, my wife and I made the decision because we've got a 99 year old grandmother that lives with us and her grandmother and so you know she's not getting any younger and or any faster and so we decided that you know it would be good for one of us to stay home and be with her but sure. still be able to work and work from home and I was the obvious choice for that because my wife works in healthcare she has the great insurance and we love her for that and so you know so I um, closed the shop and started working from home and pursued that web design, graphic design, all of that then full time. Um, it, while I really kind of transitioned as well. Um, sure. I started my transition in, um, in 2017. And, you know, by the time I closed my shop, I was fully socially transitioned, which was fun um, in a small town in, in Col Northern Colorado. But, you know, Everyone was wonderful, honestly. Um, you know, it was it was overall an immensely positive experience, which was really cool. Yes. So would you call what you're doing now then sort of an extension of the art that you started, you know, years ago when you were 18? You know, I think it's, it's still an expression of my creativity, right? I need yeah. to... I create beautiful things. That was the, the first thing, the first very first resume that I ever wrote. Um, that was underneath my name. I create beautiful things. Sure. And so whether that beautiful thing is a logo for someone or a website now, I mean, I'm still out there using my creative energies to do those sorts of things for clients. Is it, you know, masterwork oil painting of, you know, yachts and golfers? No, it's not. Um, but I live in Colorado, and there's not really as much of a marketplace for that right here, right? If I wanted to paint, Fewer you know, yards. debutantes in white dresses, if I could go and live in Boston, right? <laughs> Where that sort of thing happens. It's true. I mean, you know, there are painters on the East Coast who, who make their living doing that, right? And it's a good sure, living. Sure, sure. Yes. But that was not where I was called. And so yeah. I ended up here in Colorado, um, you know, where we don't have as much of a culture of having your portrait done when you're right. a child, right? When you're coming up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and very few yachts, like going up and down I-25. Extremely few yachts. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. It's a surprise. Like, normally they'd be coming south from Wyoming, but I don't know. Sure. Yeah. yeah re recently, yeah, it's been, it, they've been slim. 
The thin on the ground, I think, is how they put that. Exactly. The thin it's on the ground. weird. Yeah. I've done a few. You know, I've done some some work, but, you know, for the most part, it's been for me. And I love doing still life work as well now. Um, because a still life, you know, you do a portrait of someone, and there's always going to be something wrong with the mouth or the sure. eye. Right? right? Because we, the first thing that we see as human beings, when we finally are able to actually see our eyes clear, is our faces. Mm -hmm. right? Because that's the only thing that's close enough to see us, right? Our mother's face, our father's face, all the people that would see us, right? So we right. literally grow up doing nothing and, and, and spend our lives doing nothing but seeing people's faces. And so when you are trying to then represent for someone the face of someone that they love right. on a two-dimensional surface, when they are used to looking at that person in three dimensions, you know... I mean, John Singer Sargent said it the best. He said the portrait is a, pic is a, is a picture of someone, or is a painting of someone, or a drawing of someone with something wrong with the mouth. <laughs> that was what he said, right? Because he got, he got mightily tired of, of doing that, you know, of painting sure. portraits, but it was the way that he could make a living. Yeah. And so, you know, I like the still lives because no one's going to say, that's not that apple. You know. Right, right. <laughs> I remember that orange being more expressive. What That's right. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a shame, too, because I've I got to figure, you know, the light on purple, you know, would be would just be an amazing subject. Uh, it was just something I'd throw out. But. It's true. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because your hair, right, looking at your hair in the camera, you have purple, you have blue. On the yes. top of your head, there's like a rose. Right. It's almost like the ref it reflects like a rose color. It's yeah. beautiful. It, it's not yeah. on purpose. That's the, it's only one color, actually. It's I, just, I know. I know. And that's the, that's the cool thing about that, right? I love that. You can paint it. If it I'll, I will sit for you right after yeah. we get back from Denver. There you go. Um, <laughs> perfect. Um. <laughs> So I, I think you've actually answered this question, but I want to ask it one more one more time, or you know, just to make sure that, that I got the correct the correct answer. Because, um, like, what do you think is the most compelling piece of visual art that you have ever seen? Oh wow! Okay, then you didn't answer it good. So, in the National Gallery in Washington D.C. There is a painting by a gentleman named Titian. Okay. Um, it is of a woman, and it is the one of the first paintings. So Titian was, you know, do you remember in the, all of the old medieval paintings where they're like this, and the hands are really, the, the fingers are really elongated, and the shapes are really tall? Right? Sure, oh, sure, yeah. And, and then all of a sudden you see this humanist movement. It's called the humanist movement, where suddenly you have people who are drawing and painting people as they actually appear. And Titian was one of the first people that did that. Okay. And there is this painting, and I, I can't remember what year it was from, but it was a woman in a green dress, and I believe the dress is velvet. It's in the National Gallery. And again, that was a work that stopped me dead in my tracks, right? Okay. Because if you know any of the history of this, then you see this actual painting, and you're like, oh my gosh, this was like pivotal. It was controversial. You know, how dare you paint people in a humanist way, because yeah. that is the purview of God, was the perception at the time. And I so, see. you know, that, and it was luminous. It was amazing, right? It was six, seven, eight hundred years old, who knows, at that point. And the yeah. light was penetrating those layers of oil and bouncing back. And it was just, I mean, that was, that has to be one that just absolutely stopped me dead in my tracks. And then certainly yeah. just about anything that William Whitaker painted, I just adored. Um, you know, Bill, again, was, was a consummate master painter. Um, and, you know, his works regularly would stop me in my tracks. Right. And then, you know, you've heard me talk about paintings of John Singer Sargent and, mm -hmm. you know, Monet's Water Lilies and Reynolds. And so there's a lot there. Um, I've always wanted to see a Rembrandt because it's my understanding that, you know, a Rembrandt, they say that you can pick a Rembrandt up by the nose, right? But a painting, a Rembrandt painting up by the nose because he really piled on 
what the, the, the lead white, right? They use okay. lead yeah. white in their paints. And that's something I still do to this day. I still paint with lead white um, because it creates this incredible softness and luminosity in the paint. Um, and, you know, he also had, you know, untold numbers of cats. So apparently in every single one of his paintings, there are cat hairs. And in several of his paintings, there are cat paw prints. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. So yeah, I just see stuff like that. I just love, I just do it. Oh yeah, yeah, I, that would be awesome. You, you you shook loose a question I had. I was going to ask you this when you talked about Joshua Reynolds because you mentioned he used bitumen yeah. in, in in his paints. Did you have you ever experimented with different pigments? I, I, mean, I don't know how yeah. else to call that. Just different pigments. So yeah, so I've got a muller um, and you know the the glass pad sure, and sure. The, the the grinding stone the the glass. Okay. Um, grinding stone and so I've done some of that paint mixing with actually using like yellow ochre from dirt mm -hmm, uh, sure. you know, um, I did some stuff with um, actual dirt from the outback of Australia okay. right that red dirt that you see yeah. you know when you see Uluru that giant rock in the middle of Australia what they call Uluru white people call it Ayers rock but you know whatever um, but the dirt that is around there is highly, highly pigmented. Sure. And so I did create some things there. And I did some, some charcoal drawings, actually, where I mixed some of that dirt into the gesso um, um, to give me kind of this rosy-colored um, background or ground yeah. in, in order to draw on. And yeah. it also creates a real textural surface, right, because I usually get that by mixing marble dust into my ground. Um, and when you're pulling with a stick of charcoal, if the surface is super, super smooth, it, you don't get as much drag. And so if you create a little bit of texture in there, um, then you get a lot better drag off of your charcoal pencil, your charcoal sure. stick, or whatever you're sure. using. You, you weren't mixing any, like, lead oxide, right? You weren't grinding up any lead oxide for the Oh, I've, I've lead got the lead white. Oh, yeah. I got but that you're grinding of, up on your own? Just I've a got a little that. bag of lead oh of gosh. lead pigment. You mix it with oil, and yeah, yeah. no, it, it creates this beautiful lead white that is just buttery and soft and beautiful. Yeah. You know just, what I mean? Just don't think about lead it. paint, as long as you don't breathe it and as long as you don't <laughs> eat it, right? right? It's just fine. And, you know, granted, in the 1970s, we had a bunch of houses that were painted with lead paint right. inside and out. Right. And there were some small children who, as small children would, they would find stuff and pick it up and put sure. it in their mouths. Sure. And so, you know, there was this scare about, oh, lead paint is terrible and it's this horrible right. thing. But right. for all applications, it, you know, like we, like we see in many things, it, it's not true for every application. And so certainly sure. fine art painting, the use of lead in that paint, number one, it's a dryer. It makes the paint dry faster. Oh, really? Okay. But then it also helps to create this luminous quality that is just yeah. amazing. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. yeah, you don't breathe it, you don't eat it, and you're, you'll be fine. <laughs> right. But, yeah, lead oxide is a, is a, a semiconductor, like titanium dioxide. Yep. And, uh, yeah, it does some interesting things with light. I, I didn't work with lead. Cadmium I did, though, actually. And there's a cadmium... Is it red? The, yeah, the cadmium, cadmium red and cadmium orange. Oh, They're is both it? Okay. Highly, highly pigmented. If you get real cadmium red and real cadmium orange, highly, highly pigmented. It okay. takes a ton of white to bring them down. Sure. Oh, and yeah. highly toxic too. You know. Yeah. That was, uh, that was that was a lot of what I worked in and worked with in graduate uh, school, and I'm sure it didn't affect me in any adverse way. We hope not. I'm sure it did. I, I would imagine my graduate advisor, by the time I graduated, was just like, shouldn't have given her cadmium. Oh, well. Yep. You know, when you're a painter, it just it's a matter of time before your brush goes into <laughs> right. your coffee or right. your soda or something like that, right? You know? And sure. And hopefully you've noticed that you did that, but maybe not until you get this, well, oh, this tastes weird. <laughs> so, yeah. It's on my tongue. What's why is my tongue red? That's weird. I don't I didn't think that was gonna happen. It's just coke. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. The I mean, we've talked a lot about many different artists. If you were to let me just ask this question as I wrote it. What would the piece of art named Sabine 
What would that look like? Oh, wow. That's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, I would love to see it be... I mean, you know, when you're trans, there's a lot of imagery that speaks to uh, many of us commonly. Yes. Um, you know, concepts of Phoenix rising, um, things like that, right? Because we transcend um, in a way, and, you know, we think about it, we experience it, we, we feel it. Um, and we live it. And so, you know, for me, um, and you know, I'm going to answer this with a silly cartoon. It's a cartoon that I've seen, but, and I don't know whether you have seen it or not, but they basically there's like this, this male figure that is on the ground and it's like his back has been zipped open and in the middle of that back of the zipped open, you know, empty now, hollow shell of a male is this girl and she's just kneeling inside of him and she's like, you know, I'll take it from here kind of thing. Oh my gosh. And that, when the first time I saw that, it's a cartoon, right? It's not the deathless work of, you know, a, a Rembrandt or a Joshua Reynolds or a William Bouguereau, but it, it spoke to me. Oh, sure. So deeply, right? Because it I is. I got a shiver. I mean, you know, I get that, you. It is that beautiful expression of finally being authentic, mm-hmm. right? So I would want it to have some quality of that, whatever it did look like. And I don't know that I'm qualified to say what an art piece about me would be, but you know, if I if I did, I would feel like I would want to have that sensation in the work. That spirit yeah. in the work. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I, I really did get a shiver. You said that, and I went, <gasps> and, yeah, and, I, and I, I did kind of, I got a little goosebumpy <laughs> for a moment. If, if I find it, I'll share it, because it just it brings me to tears almost every time I see it. Yeah. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. It's so real for us. Yes. For many of us. I, I have to imagine. It's certainly real for me. Yeah. I have one final question. Do you, do you, want, me, you, want, you want me to ask it? Yes. All right. So I asked you what a piece of art named Sabine would look like. What, what, about, what about your own art? Have you created the piece of art, or, or, or what piece of art would you like to create that would end up serving as your legacy? That's a good question, too. You know, my art, my painting, and my expression, right, other than creating, you know, creating websites, creating logos, creating graphic design for people, that sort of stuff, that is, a, there's a level of creativity there. But for me to dig deep inside myself and say, here's what I want to finally say, Mm -hmm. I'm not there yet. I mean, I'm not there yet. I'm still, I'm still in the transition. I've gone through all of the steps and I've done all of the, the physical work, but I'm still coming to grips with this new person, new to me, you know, that I've, that has been inside me for 50 plus years, but that I'm just now getting to know. Yeah. Right? And so she has things to say in art, but I'm still in the weeds enough that I haven't been able to explore that. But that's in the future. I mean, you can see in my picture, you can see my easel right over here. Yep. Right? Beautiful, beautiful easel. Um, And it's there. And it will be in use again. And, you know, I look forward to 
digging into that. Right. Because, you know, I've been doing other things. I've been distracted. Right. And, you know, when, once, I, once I found, first of all, a partner who would see me and accept me, all of me, as much as, you know, they were able to, um, and I found enough safety that I could start exploring transition, you know, and then actually engaging in transition, not just exploring it, but engaging in it, um, that's kind of an all-consuming thing. Yes. Um, for the, you know, however long it takes us to do. And for me, you know, mine started when I met my wife in, in 2008, right? And it took me 10 years to actually, with her, to finally feel safe enough to start transition. I mean, a decade of my life went by. Sure. I still was not able to acknowledge that, even with someone who, yeah. who accepted me fully. And yeah. so, yeah, I'll get there. I'll get there, but I'm still... I'm still calming down. I'm still trying to figure out who, who is this girl that I have lived with my entire life? Who is she? And how do I live with her? And how do I be happy? And how do I not feel like there's something perpetually always wrong with me? Because there's not anymore. Right. You know, I've gone through as many steps physically as I can to, to fix all those things. And it's there. It's there, you know, and it's good. But it's a process. And so eventually I will get to that. And I hope that you and I are still friends and you can see that work when I, uh, when I finally do produce it. I, yeah, I was going to ask, when you do, make sure to let me know because okay. I would like to see it. Yeah. So. Yeah. That was heavy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I hope no, that... No, 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 no. It was great. Yeah. I'm so happy that, you know, I, I appreciate that you, that you shared all of this with me. Just, you know, um, you know, I, I, I say this to everybody and, you know, maybe it sounds like it's becoming cliched or hackneyed in some way, but, you know, I, I do think very highly of you and, and this, you know, thank your you. the feeling is absolutely mutual. Oh, 100%. thank you. The, um, you know, the, your, your truthfulness, your authenticity, truthfulness i don't know if that's the word i want your honesty your uh, your authenticity you know they they um they are all touching you know everything is touching so um i mean i think i would just say you know thank you so much for for you know taking your time and talking to me and talking so you know just so raw and and uh and and of yourself thank you you're welcome you're welcome i mean you know I can be authentic now, which means that I can let the raw part of me out, right? And that's right. important. I think it's important for us all to be able to do that. And, and if you're in a place where you can't do that, for you to be able to see that that's possible, right? And to know that, you know, someday can become every day. Right. Oh, my gosh, I know. It's it's interesting to to have people reach out occasionally and just say, just the fact that you exist you know, gives me the ability to, to make it through the, you know, this one day, you know, and then I'll exactly. find somebody else who exists and, and, uh, someday I'm going to get to my, to my day when, you know, I become, you know, the inspiration for, for the next generation. I don't want to say generation. It's been a couple you, of you years. You already are still, but... an inspiration. Look at all the things that you're doing. Oh, I wasn't talking about me. I mean, like the both of us, you know, there are people okay. who look at us and just right. go, still, holy cats, look, they made it. You know, if yeah. they made it, I can make it. And it's, they made you it. know, yeah. They so, can do it. I can do it. but that's, you know, that's, that's what you, that's what you put forth into the world. And, you know, hopefully I do that occasionally too. So you absolutely do. Um, so thank you again. Thanks so much. It, it means You're so much welcome. to have this conversation with you. Absolutely. It means a lot to me, too. And, you know, as usual, I love you, Ami. I look forward to going to the museum together. It's going to be fun. It'll be a great day. I know, we won't it? We can get some other, other folks that are interested to want to come with us. I wonder if our wives would go with us. What a... They would. They would. I, I'm sure. We may have to do, if we take my wife, we'll have to do a double, a double, double day, though. It'll have to of be course. the Botanic Gardens. For one part oh. of the day and then the museum for the next part of the day. Maybe we yes. have lunch in between. 
Yes. No, I love that. Yeah, that botanical garden. I'm going to cut this bit out. Probably. Sure. Probably not. But anybody who's seen the Denver Botanical Gardens, oh, my gosh. Especially They're when... They're special. We, we're members, and we just love going down there. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. I, I always love toward the end of the summer that there will be the, um, uh, like, but, the butterflies. You know, there will be more butterflies there. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't know. I love butterflies. You know what? It, it like it just struck me the metaphorical significance. Like I'm curious if that's why I've always thought butterflies and moths were amazing. I don't know. There is a transformation that happens there, without a doubt. Right. You know? and, and I think that that's that's important. And and that's maybe important. my metaphor, my sense of metaphor, is just <laughs> just that superficial. So. No, I mean, a butterfly is a beautiful, incredible example of nature right. transforming itself. Oh, yeah, and for so sure. Why shouldn't you take it as a, as a sign or as a symbol of something special to you? Then I shall. I, I think I'm going to paint a big butterfly on my there face. You. Okay, cool. Do you think they do face painting at the uh, Botanical Garden? Probably on a particular. We could see if we could find a day when they were doing that. Right. I fun. would do that. I would totally go get like a like a butterfly. Yes. And then go out, out on the town in Denver. Yep, with a big blue butterfly on my face. People would come up and try to rub it off. What's wrong with your? Oh, it's paint. <laughs> you know. People do that before I've got the. Uh, what's wrong with your face? Oh, so, what's wrong with your face? It's not totally true. Normally, they come up and slap it. You know, they don't try to rub oh, it. But no. No, untrue, no untrue. positive things, good things. <laughs> People untrue. love you. A couple. So, all right. I will cut it cut it short again. Was this good by number three? I think we got yeah. to. We'll, we'll, st- call it, we'll call it here. Right. I've started, like, numbering those in, in, uh, in, uh, um, like tables of context, t- contents, like the chapters in a video. Yeah. Because, you know, I'll start shutting it down. It'll be like, you know, 45 minutes in. And then by like 55 minutes in, I'm like, well, we're on goodbye number six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, what can you say? You know, it's good conversation with someone yeah. that, that sees you and can understand what you're going through completely. Right. And right. has that special perspective that nobody else that we talk to generally does, right? You're Very like, oh, true. I totally get that. I understand exactly where you're coming yep. from. Yeah, and you just you know? can't shut down a conversation. but Because yeah. there's always more. There's always more to go, and you understand this, and you understand this, yeah. and you got that. and so. Yeah. But I will actually <laughs> shut it down. Thank you again, Sabine. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Bye. Well, there is not a thing wrong with a mouth on this podcast. Sabine, you are an inspiration and a true friend, and I'm holding you to that trip to the museum. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Why Are You? If you'd like to hear more, please consider subscribing to Gender Identity today using the links you're going to find in the show notes. And until next time, remember that burning question, Why Are You? Why Are You?